Um, I'm happy to take as many questions as people want to ask, um, preferably at the end, unless someone doesn't understand something that I'm saying. But if anyone has questions during this year or at the end, I'm more than willing to take questions on um, this subject or something related. That's absolutely fine. So chinuch in general, as we as normally translated, means how to educate children. But here I'm not talking, although I work in a school, I'm not talking here about the classroom chinuch. I'm talking here about being a parent, maybe a grandparent, how to be mechanech our children in the, in the right way, in the right derech, how to get them excited about Judaism, how to get our grandchildren excited about Judaism. And the first thing that comes to mind whenever I give these talks is um, a certain, one second, sorry, I just want to get, record it as well. Yeah, the, perfect. The first thing that comes to mind is that when I, when I give shirim is I always want to say big, massive things. And people often think that when you, when you hear the way to change is to make massive, massive steps. And very often the complete opposite is true. Very often in life, the greatest changes come through making small steps. And through those small steps, you can make a massive influence on those around you. I remember um, when I was living in Israel, there's a very famous speaker there called um, Leib Kellerman, Rabbi Leib Kellerman. And he was a very interesting life. I think he was a radio DJ and a talk show host. And he became from, I think. And um, he's a marriage counselor. And he was talking about being a marriage counselor. And he started off a sheer by saying, you know, the, whenever he starts marriage counseling, the, the couple always comes in the first day and they sit down and he always says to them, you know, why are you here? And always it's the same thing. The husband says, I've got no idea. And the wife will then always say, well, I know why we're here. And he'll say, why? And she'll go, well, you know, um, you, you do this thing where you, you, you know, you, you leave your shoes on the stairs every day. You leave your shoes on the stairs and I keep on telling you not to and you keep on doing it. And then she'll say, well, you leave the toothpaste open. You never close the toothpaste. It's been 20 years. I've told you, close the toothpaste. And then she'll say, but you get your coat. You leave it on the dining room table. I don't want your coat on the dining room. And then she'll say, well, you know, you do the toothpaste. You leave your shaver out. You don't, cl you don't close. You don't put your shaver away. I have to see the hairs. And suddenly, Rob Kellerman said to me, it said in the shear, he said, you know, he looks at these people and he thinks they're going to get divorced over toothpaste. They're going to get divorced over shoes. And very often it's these small things that we do in life that we don't realize changing small things in our lives can make a massive, massive difference on those people around us. And very often in Chinuch, it's not about massive things. You're not suddenly going to be someone who, you know, never, um, you know, very rarely wants to give a Dvar Torah to suddenly being, you know, Rebus and Kanievsky and all you want to do is learn Torah all day. Or you don't enjoy saying to Hillim and suddenly you're going to go from now on I'm just going to say to Hillim all day, I'm never going to stop. That very rarely works. And even if someone tries it very often, it will just lead to you burning out and your the, the loss is often more than the gain. Very often in life, the biggest thing to do is to make small steps. And through those small steps, we can get great success, especially when it comes to influencing people around us with our example. The topic of the shir, what we're going to be using to kind of... Um, find meaning in and to talk about Hinnah, because we're going to be talking about a safer a book in Kosovim, in the writings, which is called Mishle. Now, there's going to be a whole series of seed shirim, of jewel shirim, all about Mishle, and I'm sure many people are going to go into it in more depth. But Mishle itself is like a book of, it's almost poetic in a way, and it's a book of sayings, and it's written by someone called Shlomo HaMelech. Now, many of you, I'm sure, I can't see anyone, so I can't see anyone nodding, because it's just a bunch of black screens, but I would assume that most of you have heard of Shlomo HaMelech, Shlomo HaMelech was David HaMelech's son, and he was responsible for building the first base on Mikdash. Now, I always find whenever I'm going to read a book, the first thing people do when they're going to read a book is go on Amazon, and you want to see the reviews. You want to see, does it have good reviews? Who's the author? Who wrote it? Is it someone I can relate to, someone I can't relate to? If I tell you a little bit about Shlomo HaMelech, maybe it will inspire people to want to know more and more. Shlomo HaMelech, Chazal say, the rabbis say, Hashem said to him, you can have whatever you want. Do you want money, power, whatever you want? And the story goes that he said to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, he said, I only want, I want Chochmah. Now it turns out he was very wealthy as well. And he was extremely clever, but he asked for Chochmah to be wise, to have wisdom. And Chazal tell us that he was the most wisdom-filled person ever since he ever lived. There was never anyone like Shlomo HaMelech. He had a complete understanding of the world. The Midrash says that he was able to understand the way the animals, how they were talking to each other, whatever the deeper meaning there is. But he had unbelievable wisdom and understanding. And when he writes something, we jolly well listen. So Mishle is a book which is written by Shlomo HaMelech, who was 
one of the, if not the wisest, one of the wisest people who ever lived. His father was David Melech. So what else, who else could we learn um, from? So what's interesting is many people will think to themselves, well, okay, so he's a very holy man. He's a very special person. It doesn't, you don't necessarily have to learn things from, in, from the most incredible people that ever le- lived. Perhaps you can learn from people who are an expert in a certain field. There's nothing wrong with that. So I want to tell you a story. There was once, a f- I, I don't know if the story's true. I, tried, I did some Google research. I couldn't get a clarity, but it's a great story anyway. There was once a philosophy professor, I think it was at Cambridge, and he was teaching philosophy, a non-Jewish fellow, and he was teaching philosophy. And after a few years, they discovered that he was, um, didn't his, 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 his morals were, let's say, loose. And it caused a bit of an uproar. Nowadays, it probably wouldn't, but then it caused a bit of an uproar. And they pulled him in. And they said, right, you're teaching philosophy and, you know, you're not, you're not faithful to your wife and you're out gallivanting and what's going on? How can you teach philosophy? Non-Jewish fellow. So he turns around to them and he says, you don't have to be a triangle to teach maths. You don't have to be a triangle. Just because I teach philosophy doesn't mean I have to be a moral person. I want to tell you that in terms of Torah, the complete opposite is true. To be someone who, who, who's listened to in the world of Torah, it's not enough that it's just theory. It's not enough that it's a nice, pretty book that we read and take messages from. It's something that you have to internalize and yourself, you have to be an improved person in your own self to help those people around you. And Shlomo HaMelech is the exact example of someone who lived a life of holiness. He was rich, he was wise, he had everything you could ever ask for. And all he ever talks about in Mishle mostly is the importance of Torah and the importance of mitzvahs. When it comes to secular wisdom, there's nothing wrong with secular wisdom. We all, there's tremendous wisdom in the secular world and there's wonderful books on education in the secular world. But the thing that people need to realize is the difference between secular wisdom and Torah wisdom, especially in books books like Mishle, is secular wisdom evolves. There's no doubt even the most prestigious secular mind will tell you that over the years, secular wisdom constantly evolves, it changes, theories change, science changes, philosophy can often change. Um, every type of science seems to change, even if it's um, psychology. And, but it's still true, and we still learn a great deal from it. The Torah, the Mish- Mishle, these Sfarim are written with Ruach HaKodesh. They're written with a spark of holiness, and they're timeless, they're infinite. They're teaching us about a world which is eternal. And when they listen, we need to really, when they talk, we really need to, to wake up and listen. Okay, so what is the point of Mishle? Well, the point of Mishle, as I've already said, is to teach us, which is something called Midas or Midot. Midas is a type of, I I guess I would explain it as meaning personality traits. Someone has good Midas. He's a lovely boy. I want him for my daughter. He's got good Midas. People often hear people say that. Oi, he's a a direct, he's a terrible Midas. Midas is a way in which we describe someone's personality traits. Someone can be kind, it's good Midas. Someone can shout a lot, it's normally a bad Midas. Midas is a personality trait. The real Nagon, he expanded the greatest minds of the last five, six hundred years in rabbinical literature, the Vilna Gaon tells us that the whole point, and I think it's actually in his commentary of Mishle, he says the whole point of Torah and the whole point of all the mitzvahs is to refine a person's midas, is to make them a more refined individual. Now, many people, they're being honest with themselves, and we can be honest here because everyone's a blank screen anyway, so I can't see anyone, but we'll be completely honest here. Many people when they hear that, they might think to themselves, yeah, but you see it doesn't work. You see very often, often it does work, but you see very often people can have tremendous amounts of Torah and they can live a life of Torah, but the Midas aren't necessarily improving. I remember, I'll give you an example. And the truth is, and the reason for this, I'll just say before the example, is Midas is a very great area. It's something which the Torah tells us, keep Shabbos. The Torah says, eat kashras cut kosher food. The Torah says, you know, um, where sits it, all these different mitzvahs, but it doesn't necessarily tell us how to behave. When should you lose your temper? When should you not lose your temper? How, how, how do you speak to someone who's like this? How do you speak to someone like this? And it's a massive, massive gray area when it comes to the world of Midas in Torah. And therefore books like Mishle come along to kind of refine one's idea of what good Midas are within a Torah framework, what Hashem wants us to be like in our actual character traits. Now, I remember 
we all suffer from this, this mix of a mix between when to act in a certain way and when not to. So an example of myself, I remember it often happens. You have this ideal of Shabbos, this tremendous ideal that Shabbos, the house is lovely and everyone's clean and the children are showered and they're standing there in a line like in what's the thing? Um, the sound of music. They're all standing in line and daddy comes down to go to the to shore and everyone waves daddy goodbye. And as he's walking out, you know, everyone's walking down the street, singing along. And and then you get married and you have a few kids and you realize that Erev Shabbos can be insane. And you're trying to get out the house and you're like moving that one out of the way and you're holding this one and this one's on your back and this one's holding onto your socks and you're like punching this one out. And suddenly you get to shore and you're completely schwitzing and you think to yourself, what does Hashem actually want? Does Hashem want me to do that? Does Hashem want me to be calm and help my wife? Does Hashem want me to go to shore right now? Does Hashem want me to dive in at home? It's very hard to have a proper understanding of Midas of character traits without learning books like Mishle. It's very hard to know the balance of keeping the mitzvahs with character traits without books such as Mishle and other svarim like that. I remember my wife and I were working in, in a little bit, we did a tiny bit of Kirov in Eretz Israel, and we're working somewhere called Neve. When Neve is, um, uh, I don't know if some of you know it, it's a program, um, like a, a seminary for girls who, let's say, don't come, normally don't come from traditional backgrounds. They want to learn about Judaism. And I remember my wife said, you should do, the, you should do a Q&A. We should take them away for Shabbos. And she said, you should do a Q&A with them. And they can ask whatever they want. So I remember I was very excited because, um, you know, I get to stand on the stage and my wife thinks I'm clever. So I remember getting very, very excited. And I started preparing, doing research. Evolution. How do you answer if someone asks you about evolution? How do you answer if someone asks you about dinosaurs? The world being made, science says it's millions of years old. How do you answer all these questions? And I did tons of research. The first Shabbos comes along and I'm standing there. And the first girl says, I've got a question. I go, what's your question? She says, where I live, they've got a from neighbor. And my from neighbor, he always blocks my drive. He always parks across my drive. And I've talked to him so many times and he keeps on doing it. How come he does it if he's from? So I said, well, he's wrong. Oh, okay, next question. Rabbi Richmond, we went to the Kotel last night, not on Shabbos, and there were all these from people and they were smoking. How can a from person smoke, Rabbi Richmond? And I'd say, uh, uh, and I'd be startled. And I started to realize that very often we need to understand that the way we portray ourselves as from people has tremendous ramifications. But very often we need to kind of have a massive, massive influence through these books such as Mishle to refine our characteristics for ourselves, also for our children, and also for those for those people around us. Okay. Um, when it comes to Midas, many people might say, well, I'm a parent, the kids aren't necessarily going to learn from me. They go to school, they come home for a couple of hours. How, how much of an influence am I really going to have on my kids when it comes to Midas? I'm not going to sit with them and I want to tell you something. And this is as a teacher, children, as my wife, I'm going to quote my wife here, but she actually said this, children are little mirrors. Some of them are big mirrors and the mirrors get bigger and bigger and bigger as they live their lives. Children are like mirrors. And I can prove this to you for me. The other day, I've got a few children, Baruch Hashem, and one of them, they're always absolute angels. But at once in about 20 years, they have an argument. So the four-year-old, no, he's probably older than that now. And the eight-year-old, he's probably older than that. We're having a bit of an argument, and one of them started shouting at the other one. You get off here, I had it first. No, I had it first, screaming and shouting. So I went over and I lost, I said, will you give that back to him, please? And stop shouting at him. And my daughter looked at me and she said, well, you're shouting at me. You've, you're losing your temper with me and telling me not to shout, but I'm losing my temper and shouting at him. And I realize that very often children actually emulate the parents to such a large degree. And we have to be so careful about the way we behave at home because we can have such an influence on them. I remember at parents evening, a few, uh, pre-COVID in 1972, I remember in a parents evening, we had parents there and um, they, a couple of years ago, in where I work in Broughton Jewish, and a certain parent, he came, well, a wife actually, and a husband, they sat in front of me. And parents evening is always entertaining because they don't wear name tags. So it makes it much more fun, especially when they say, yeah, I'm Mrs. Smith and you've got six, you know, Smiths in the class. So these parents, they both sat opposite me and I said, hi, how are you? And I remember the father, he said to me, Robert Richmond, you look very hot. It's quite hot in here. You've been seeing so many people, one after the other. Maybe we should get you a drink. I said, no, it's not necessary. It's fine. No, no, we'll get you a drink. We'll get you a drink. 
I said, it's not necessary. Then they will get you a drink. And I said to them, I'm going to have to make up a name because data protection. So I said, are you Moshi's parents? Not his real name. And they said, yeah, 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 yeah. And I said, I'll tell you how I know. I said, Moishi, very often I have him after morning break on a Friday. And I'm on break duty on a Friday. And anyone who teaches will tell you break duty is fun, but it also means you don't get a break, even though it's called break duty. They trick you. It's really a duty which takes you away from your own break. So I'm doing break duty and I have Moishi after break duty. And Moishi always comes up to me after break duty, says, Reba Richman, you didn't get a break. Would you like me to go and get your glass of water before the lesson? Every week without fail. And the parents, I said, they had a lot of nachas. Now, that's not something that those parents have said, Moishi, you go up to Rebbe Richmond today and you tell him because it's a mitzvah. It's a mitzvah. That's not, that's not what's happening there. That child at home sees chesed and kindness all the time, and it makes him want to do it for other people. It says in Aisha's Chayel, it says, Shema b'nei Musa v'icha v'lo titosh toira simecha. You should follow the, the Musa of your father, the ways of your father, and the Torah of your mother. You should follow the Torah. Don't move away from the Torah of your mother. Very often, women will ask themselves, is the Torah in the house really my responsibility? It's the husband's responsibility. I'm doing this, and I'm helping, and I'm getting everything ready, and I'm doing this rotors, and I'm doing lots of the cooking, and I'm doing every The Torah, that's my husband's job. You often hear this. It's not true. First of all, it's not true at all, because the truth is, it might be a husband's job per se to bring Torah into the house, but it's the woman's job in very often in a Torah home. First of all, there's nothing wrong with a woman at all at the Shabbos table having a Devar Torah or anything like that. But assuming she hasn't got time to make a Devar Torah, assuming she's busy, she's working. I want to tell you something that my wife does, and I think it, I learned it from her, and I never told her to do it, but I'm still going to take credit from it. So. On a Friday night, very often, we have little children at the table. And as you know, Friday night, you make a lot of effort. And very often, you and your wife or husband, whoever, can be very tired. And you're sitting at the table, and you want to make it nice for your kids. But it's not always easy. So very often, I want to give a Devar Torah. So I say, OK, Daddy wants to give a Devar Torah. And everyone's talking. And this one took my fork. And he got a bigger portion than me. And it's not fair. He got two cups of coke. I only got one. And the whole back and forth. I often find that my wife will go, shh, daddy's giving a Devar Torah, daddy's giving a Devar Torah, and they'll, and they'll calm down. Now, it seems like nothing, but I want to tell you that the little thing like that has massive, massive ramifications, because the difference between me saying, I'm giving a Devar Torah, I'm giving a Devar Torah, everyone be quiet, I'm giving a Devar Torah, can you stop talking, Meira, can you stop talking, is what you're talking with the children. The message that sends is Torah is not important in the home. Daddy, Torah is important to daddy, but it's not so important to anyone else. When mummy qu quietens everyone down, when it comes from mummy, what that says to the children subconsciously and consciously is I want to hear daddy's Devar Torah. I want to hear daddy's Devar Torah and therefore everyone's got to be quiet. That has a massive psychological ramification of the importance of Torah in the house and it's a tiny step that we can do. I remember when we talk about following the Torah of, of, of Imecha, Shlomo Melech tells us, following the Torah of your mother, I want to just tell you, I read a book recently, and it talked about Rav Shlomo Zaman Orbach. Now, Shlomo Zaman Orbach was one of the massive Rabbonim who lived in Eretz Yisrael around, he died, I think, about 20, 20 30 years ago. A massive Rav, a Poisek, a brilliant mind. And they asked him, all of his sons become great, became great, great, great rabbinical figures in their own right. One of them's a rub of Tiberia, one of the rub here and the rub there, um, incredible minds. And they said to him, how did you do it? How did you do it that they're all such brilliant minds? And I was expecting him to say, well, I learned with them and I sat with them and I woke with them at six in the morning. He didn't say that. He said something very interesting. He said, I would tell them stories about Rabbi Akiva Eger. Now, Rabbi Akiva Eger was a, one of, one of, another great rabbi from a few hundred years ago. But he would tell them stories about rabbinical figures. And this is something that we all do. And it's something that we can all do. And it's quite hard. Because often when we have bedtime, the kids want a story. So the stories that we can pull out and read to them, we can go to the library. And you, or you can go on Amazon and you can get 17 books for $2.99 delivered the next day. Or you can go to the library and you can get 25 books and it doesn't cost a penny. And you go into the Jewish bookshop and you want to read a Jewish book and the art scroll book costs 20 pounds and you read it and then you have to buy another one. It's another 20 pounds and it can be challenging. But the truth is 
it's so important that the children, that the tome has stories about Gedolim, stories about rabbis, stories about people who are special Torah minds, stories about famous Rebbitsons. And through that, we can really help them to make the superheroes in their life be Jewish figures. It's the most important thing, honestly, to bring this into the home. And if you don't know where to get them from, they have Jewish libraries, and it might be worth investing some money in this in, in the Jewish bookshops or Jewish libraries or gemachim or borrowing books. And it makes a massive, massive, massive difference. It's so important that we, 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 we make Torah important in the home. Now, I, I heard a story this is a funny story, but it's a true story, so I'm going to tell it. This is a story I heard from my, one of my rabbis in Israel, who was called Rabbi David Gottlieb. Now, Rabbi David Gottlieb was a professor of philosophy, and um, he became from, he says it about himself, and he tells the following story. Rabbi David Gottlieb told me that he had a friend who lived in Hanoff, that's in Israel, in Jerusalem, and this friend's son, an American fellow who moved to Israel when he was about 50, and this person had a son, and this boy moved to Israel when he was about 10, went to a normal school in America, a normal yeshiva school. And he, then he went to, yesh, to yeshiva in a uh, school in Israel when he was about 10 to at least about 12, 16. This son of this American working normal man became one of the biggest rabbis in Bnei Brak, which is a very from neighborhood next to Tel Aviv. Rabbi David Gottlieb said to me, he said to his friend, how on earth, how on earth did your son, I mean, it may sound a bit rude, but they're obviously close friends. How did your son become the biggest rabbi in B'nai Brak? You're American, you're very normal, you're a working guy. He went to Israeli schools only when he was 10. It's, it's unheard of such a thing. It's the equivalent of someone going to school at 10, having very little education before that, and ending up at, I don't know, top of the class in Cambridge and getting a triple master's dissertations. I don't know what it is. More than that, even. So this man told Robert Gottlieb the following story. He said, you know, I don't know for sure, but I do know this. He said, my son had to leave for yeshiva at six o'clock in the morning when we were living in Hanoff to get to the other side of Jerusalem in time for the morning prayers for Shacharit. So what I would do is we had three floors. My son was on the top floor, the attic, I think it's called. I was in the basement with my wife and there was a middle floor which had the front door and the kitchen. My son would leave at six. He set an alarm for 5.30. I would set my alarm for 5.55. Now, what I would do is my alarm would go off. I'd roll out of bed. I'd quickly put on my, my dressing gown. I'd sit at the table. I'd open a Gomorrah. As my son came down from the attic at two minutes to six, because he had to catch the bus, he would see me sitting at the table learning. And he would say, poor daddy, look at you. You love learning Torah so much. And I'd say, have a lovely day, Moishi. Moishi would walk out the door. He'd close the door. And this daddy would close his Gomorra, go back to bed and get up at 10 a.m. Now that you can laugh or you can be a blank screen. That is a true story told to me by one of a massive Rav in Eretz Israel who verified the story. So you can hear that story and go, what, what's he doing? What's he playing at? The story is magnificent because we have to understand that boy, it worked. That boy grew up with we love Torah in our home. We love mitzvahs in our home. Sometimes it's hard, but we still have to give over the message to our children that being Jewish, that keeping mitzvahs is an incredible privilege and an amazing thing. When a husband, I wanted to say also, again, from my own life, I mean, it's, I'm giving advice about chinuch is somewhat ironic because often I don't know what I'm doing myself, but therefore sometimes the best advice is from people who are honest about themselves. Very often, you know, when a husband wants to go out and learn. So it's hard for a wife because very often a husband has a, a mitzvah of going out to learn and he can go out to learn. And a woman as well should definitely go out and hear shirim and everything else. But very often the problems that can emerge in a house are like this. The husband goes out to learn with his He leaves his wife at home. The wife is now at home and she's got four children, one on the lap, one's painting her face with felt tip, the other one's trying to grab onto her sock, the other one's in the bathroom and needs help, the other one's in the fridge emptying the cottage cheese on his head. And this goes on for about two hours. The husband's learning, he's having a nice cup of coffee, he's learning. Suddenly, two hours later, he comes home, he's all inspired, he feels great. <clears throat> He opens the door and she is often, it's very hard. And I, I can't cope, it's so hard, it's very hard. I had the kids. Now you should know the way that that is, is completely normal to feel that way. 
And I'll tell you, my wife does this, uh, I don't know exactly, uh, whatever, a certain course that she does once a week. She leaves me for two hours with the children. When she comes home, I'm literally on the floor. I don't know how to do it. Even within 20 minutes, I'm gone. I can't multitask. I've got this one there and that one's on my head and I'm trying to do bedtime, but I'm the one falling asleep before them. So first of all, looking after children anyway is an incredible thing and women are clearly brilliant at it. Um, but it, when my wife comes back from the course, I physically can't cope. And when I go out to learn, I said to her, and she said to me as well, it's very important that when the husband walks in, and I'd say the same thing if I was speaking to men, and I might be, because it's all blank screens, but I would say the same thing if I was speaking to men, when the wife goes to a shear, but since I'm speaking to women, I'll say it to women. When the husband goes out to learn, and he comes home, and it's hard, and the kids are crazy, and you've got felt tip all over your face, praise him for learning in front of the children. Let them hear it. Say to them, wow, I'm so happy you went out to learn. It's absolutely brilliant that you're, that you're, that you're going out to learn, that you're trying to be a Talmud Chochem. Now, later, of course, when the kids are in bed, you can say to him, it's awful, it's terrible, it's so hard, if you want to, and he should help more, which he should, and maybe he, you should have put your feet up for an hour before he goes out to learn. Don't tell them I said that, but that's also probably a good option. But the idea is, is that the, t the children should see that mummy wants daddy to learn Torah, and Torah is important in the home. It also says in Mishlei, tishma, which basically means you should follow the path of the just. You should be straight in your ways. Now, we often think to ourselves, how can we be straight in our ways? How much of an influence can we really have on our children around us to keep them on the right path? Now, I want to tell you a very difficult story that I read a few years ago. This story is difficult to understand. It's in the Chumash, and I'm going to try and hopefully explain it. We all know that Yaakov had a daughter called Dina in the Torah. And Yaakov lived with Lavan for many years. He had 12 sons and a daughter called Dina. He, he had to run away from Esav. This is coming up in a, in a week or two as Parshas. And he's coming back and he's going to meet Esav and he's scared. So the Medrash says, not the Torah itself, but the Medrash says that he hid Dina. He hid her in a box because he didn't want Esav to lay his eyes on her because he was worried that Esav would want to marry her. He would want to marry her. So he hid her. Chazal say, the Medrash says, Dina then later on in the Torah, she gets kidnapped by someone, has a terrible ordeal, eventually they rescue her. And one of the, one of the, the Medrash, it says, now again, this isn't literal, this is just teaching us a message, but one of the Medrashim says, it says, you know, the reason that you could say that maybe this happened to Dina is because Yaakov didn't want her to marry Esau. Yaakov should have wanted his daughter to marry Esav, and therefore the fact that he didn't want her to marry Esav was why terrible things happened to her, because he should have wanted her to marry Esav. I read this medrash, I wanted to fall off my chair. Who on earth would want their daughter to marry Esav? Is it, is it insane? Imagine reading the Shidduch, the Shadkan calls you up for the Shidduch profile. Oi, he's such a lovely boy. Yes, he's beautiful. He goes hunting, he kills people in his spare time. He still sings, he's a robber. Beautiful. The parents will buy a flat, but still. You're talking about an absolute rusher, the most, the most terrible person you could ever imagine, right? And, oh, he should have, this is Dina, my daughter. She's beautiful. Look at her, lovely. What are you talking about? She wants you to sit and learn. What are you talking about? Who would want their son to marry such a person? Their daughter to marry such a person? The answer is, and if you understand this, you can understand the effect of what a woman is. Dina would have changed Aesop. And it's almost sure she would have. Dina, a base Yaakov girl, sheltered, would have changed the most awful, despicable person that ever lived. Chazal were telling us, that a woman has the power to change a person always for the better. That had Esau married Dina, she would have changed him. And through Esau came the Romans and the Greeks and the Nazis and all of these people who came from Esau, they all would have not came about from him because Esau would have done teshuva and Esau would have been would have found Hashem all because of Dina. And when you understand that, you can see the mistake that Yaakov made. And we can take this message and understand what an influence we can be on those people around us. I remember in school, being an influence, talking about being an influence on those people around us. I remember in school a couple of years ago, um, 
we had a problem with benching. Very often, kids don't bench properly. Very often, adults don't bench properly. But let's just talk about school right now. So we had a problem with the kids benching properly. So we're in the staff room, and one of the staff members says to me, how do you think we could sort out um, the kids benching? So someone said, we should get a PowerPoint and have a sticker chart and da -da 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 -da, all these ideas. So I said something, which I wouldn't say now, but I said it then because I was a bit chutzpahed. So I said, you know what we should do? We should bench with Kavana. As a staff, we should eat lunch in there and we let the kids see us benching properly. The message, maybe it was slightly tongue in cheek, but the message is that when we do things in front of our children, they notice. And when we don't do them, they also notice. It's like the famous story. I remember, when, so I remember also when we went on holiday and I'm, you know, daddy goes to Shacharis during the week and it, he's gone for like, you know, an hour, right? And then we go to this holiday home in, I don't know, the middle of Shropshire, wherever it was. And, you know, daddy does in Shacharis in the spare room and he's in that in six, eight minutes. The kids notice that. The kids aren't silly. Why is Shacharis taking 12 minutes when daddy does at home? But when he goes to shore, it takes an hour. So that we have to understand when mummy benches and it takes 30 seconds and she's not even looking at the, at the bencher, we have to understand it's having an influence on those around us and we need to make an effort to, 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 do, to do things in the proper way. You know, it's like the person, very right, often, you know, children, they want to share Torah thoughts with us and they, want, they, they learn, they're so inspired in school and they come home and very often we, we don't take that inspiration and build on it. They see contradictions in the home and it's the most terrible thing because you're taking them down. Often we're taking, our, we're taking the children down with us. It's like the person on the boat, you know, the captain in the middle of the night, everyone's sleeping on the big cruise ship. In the middle of the night he hears, <laughs> He goes, what is that racket? So he starts walking around and eventually he hears coming from the bottom deck and he opens up the door and he sees this Meshuggana in his bedroom drilling a hole in the floor of the boat. The captain says, what are you doing? You can't drill a hole in the boat. The water will seep through and we're all going to drown. He goes, no, it's my bedroom. I'll do what I want. The message is, is that sometimes in life, our behavior, whether we like it or not, can influence those around us. And we must try our best to be the best possible people that we can be. You know, it says in Mishle, it says in Aisha's High, I think they're having share about Aisha's Hile later, aren't you? So I won't talk too much about Aisha's Hile. But what I would say is it says in Aisha's Hile, Rabois Banois Asuchil, but at Alecha al Kulana. It says in Aisha's Hile, many women do well, but you, when we're singing it to our wives, you, super, you um, surpass them all. A woman's weight is the most incredible thing to focus on. And when do we sing Aisha's Chayel? We sing it at Shabbos tables. And I said before about Kirov, and I think there's a couple of people here who maybe work in Kirov or have worked in Kirov. And I want to tell you, the biggest Kirov weapon in the entire world is not answering questions about evolution, is not answering questions about why the bad things happen to good people. The biggest Kirov weapon in the world is Shabbos tables. It's sending when someone who is not yet affiliated at all, goes into a proper Jewish home and sees a Shabbos table and sees a husband and a wife speaking to each other properly and sees no phones and sees children who hopefully are treating each other respectfully and there's no phones, there's no television, there's conversations that are uplifting rather than downgrading. It's not conversations about lush and horror and things like that. It's conversations that are, are positive and bring on nice ramifications. That's the most incredible thing and I can tell you that that is what really influenced people for the better. The problem is that we used to send people to Shabbos tables and they would be very, very inspired. So then my wife and I decided we'll have people at our Shabbos table and they'll be very inspired. And I just found that what would often happen is Erev Shabbos was just insane. We're trying to clean the house. And as you're cleaning the house, because you've got guests coming who have never seen a from family before, your daughter, who's three years old, is pouring the toys on the floor as you're putting them in the basket. As you're opening your oven, and the other two-year-old is opening the fridge and taking out the milk, and she decides it would be nice to do some kind of milk concoction in her hair because like an organic shampoo. And Shabbos comes in, and you're completely frizzled. But then at the table, everything seems to fall into place. And I remember thinking to myself, it's hard work, this Shabbos thing. It's hard work. We shouldn't kid ourselves. But then I realized that when I'm sitting there, with these families used to come and visit us. And when I'm sitting there with my wife and the children, it makes everything worth it. All the hard work that goes into mitzvahs, and it, is, it can be hard. We shouldn't kid ourselves. It's okay to say things are hard sometimes. The final result is what makes all of the hard work worth it. And when you sit there at a proper Shabbos table, and again, the woman here has such a powerful responsibility to make a positive atmosphere at the Shabbos table. If she maybe give a Devar Torah, if she doesn't want to give a Devar Torah, have a nice story. If she doesn't have a nice story, show interest in her children's 
Devar Torah was from school, show interest in her husband's Devar Torah, ask people about their weeks. Everything needs to bounce off the woman. And even if she's tired, and even though she's worked hard, and she's been at work all day, and now she's looking after the children, a husband and a wife's job is from nine till five. And then they have another job, and that job starts from five till nine. And that's being parents. And we shouldn't think, and I do this myself. I get home from work and I'm like being in the classroom all day. I walk in at 5.30. I've just governed Mincha, Mariv maybe. And I'm exhausted and I sit on the couch and I want my, everyone to, you know, come and say hello to me and then leave. But you can't, you're a father. And you have to realize that you, you're there for your children right now. And you have to do homework with them and you have to ask them how their day was. And it's hard, but that's what makes good parents. And in the long run, you, that's what creates beautiful neshamas and beautiful children as well. Showing an interest in them and making, especially on Shabbos, when we're all together, when all the phones are off and everything like that, that's when mummy and daddy really, really, when the job starts on those Shabbos meals, to make every effort you can to make them as spectacular as possible. It also says in, in Mishle, probably the most famous quote, Chanuch lenar al pidarcho, gam ki, gam you should educate a child according to their way. And when he's old, he won't leave from, from the path of from Torah and mitzvahs. You should educate a child in the proper way. You shouldn't try and always do things because, well, it worked for this one, so I'll do it for this one. It worked from Rochel, so I'll, I'll do the same chinuch with Sarah. Absolute nonsense. When it comes to Torah and mitzvahs, you have to know what each child needs, and you have to give it to them in the proper way. There's a famous Gemara. The Talmud says... Um, one of the most famous rabbis in the in the Talmud is called Marzutra. It means the son of Zutra. So, so Marzutra. So Marzutra, he they're talking in the Gemara, the Talmud, about how long you should wait between meat and milk. Yeah, the halacha, the Jewish halacha is, is that after eating meat, you have to wait a certain amount of time before milk. It's from the rabbis. It's a rabbinical. It's from from the rabbinical literature that discusses it. And there's a machloikis, an argument over how long you should wait. And Marzutra says. I'm like vinegar and my father is like wine. They said, why? He says, because my father, I wait from one meal to the next before from meat to milk, so a few hours, whatever that is. Whereas my father, he would wait 24 hours. We, no one does that nowadays, but that's what Marzutra said. I'm like vinegar, my father's like wine. I wait from one meal to the next from meat to milk. My father would wait a whole day. <laughs> so that's the end of the, that, that little Gemara there. It's such a strange Gomorrah because Marzutra, you're in the Gomorrah. You're probably one of the holiest people that ever lived. Why on earth don't you just emulate your father? If you're like vinegar and your father's like wine and he's so special because he waited 24 hours. Um, hello, why don't you just wait 24 hours and be like him? Hey, it's not that hard. They say anyone in the Gomorrah was on the greatest minds we could ever, we could ever expect to meet in our lives. We would never see such a person. He can't wait 24 hours. He can't be like his father who waited 24 hours. The answer is, and, the, and a lot of the rabbinical literature says this, is it wasn't right for him. It wouldn't have helped his service of Hashem. It would have had detrimental. He would have said, why am I waiting 24 hours? The idea of Judaism and taking on things and doing mitzvahs is that they should be natural to you and you should enjoy the mitzvahs. If you're forcing yourself to do mitzvahs and forcing yourself to take on these things, very often you, the, the loss is more than the gain. And that's the message of the Gemara. He didn't wait 24 hours because it would have been detrimental for him. We, when we raise our kids, we should realize also there that his father never forced him to wait 24 hours. For me, this is what I do. But for my son, no, it's not right for him. And we should realize that sometimes we have to be lenient. I can't give individual, um, now individual ideas of when and how, because it's just not the time frame, or I don't know any, anyone well enough. But we have to know when to be lenient with our kids, and we have to know when to let, when to back off from them and we have to know when to push them a bit you know very often we, we put pressure on our children to do mitzvahs and it's completely counterproductive completely counterproductive because your loss is more than your gain and sometimes we don't do it for the right reasons we're not doing it because we love Hashem and because we love the child we're doing it because well the neighbor's son goes to Darchin the neighbor the neighbor's son goes to others on him and learns the neighbor's son has already finished all of Shas the neighbor's son so it must be my son the neighbor's son always wears his hat when he walks up so we automatically think well maybe my son should do the same thing the neighbor 
very often it's the worst thing you can do. You have to educate your children what's right for them. And what would Hashem want you to do now? Not what the neighbors would want. What would Hashem want you to do right now? Not what the school wants. What would Hashem want you to do right now? It reminds me of a story. There was a story by Rav Zethlef, a very big rabbi who lives in Israel now. He lived in America in Miami Beach. And he said he had a congregant there. In Miami Beach, very elderly congregant. And on Yom Kippur, you have to fast. But if there's any doubt at all about someone getting sick or ill in a way that it could be life threatening, you're not allowed to fast and it's a mitzvah to eat. You're not allowed to fast. So Reb Lef went to visit an elderly man who was not well and he went with a doctor. And the doctor said, without a doubt, this man should not fast on Yom Kippur. Without a doubt, it's completely forbidden for him to fast. Reb Lef then said to the man, you're not allowed to fast on Yom Kippur. I'm the Rav of the Shul. You're not allowed to fast. This man looked at him. He said, I don't care what you say. I've never missed a fast in 78 years. I'm fasting on Yom Kippur, whether you like it or not. Rav Lef said, no, no, it's a, you're not allowed. It's the mitzvah for you not to fast. He said, no, I'm 78 and I'm telling you I'm fasting. Rav Lef said to him, okay, you want to fast, you can fast. But please don't daven in our shul anymore. Don't be a member of our community anymore. The man said, what do you mean? I've always davened in your shul. Rav Lef said, no. He said, in our shul, we serve Hashem, we serve God, you serve Yom Kippur. In our shul, we serve Hashem, you serve Yom Kippur. You have to know what does Hashem want me to do right now for my children. And this is something that you need, often will need judgment from someone outside the family or in the family if you can be um, neutral. But don't push your kids in a way where you're going to just push them off a cliff. Honestly, keep the Torah and the mitzvahs a happy way of life. I remember we, I had a rabbi, uh, I'm not going to say his name, he wouldn't want me to, but they lived in Telstone. And I remember my wife and I, we went there once for a Shabbos. I was very close to this rabbi. Still am. Not as close to live here, but I was very close to him. And I took my wife when we first got married to stay with him for a Shabbos. And I remember all his children were there. And Baruch Hashem, he had a lot of kids. And my wife and I were sitting at the Shabbos table, and one of them was in an army uniform. One of them was in a black hat. He was living in a, a Poisek, a Rav in somewhere else. One of them was a bit Hasidish. One, and this is not a joke, right? It sounds like a joke, right? As in, you know, walks into a bar, but it's not. One of them was, you know, wearing a knitted couple when he lived in a settlement somewhere. They're all sitting around the table, and they're all getting on and joking, and all his children. And I said to my wife, I said, what are these kids? What a, what a strange family. They're all so different. She went, yeah, it's good parents. She said, when you let your children be themselves and you let them be organic in their chinuch and in your chinuch towards them, that's when you reap rewards. And they were all proud of who they were because they were allowed to live their lives in a proper, natural way. And they didn't have things forced upon them. And that's the sign of good parents. You know, Rav Hirsch says about Esav and Yaakov, which we've got not in a couple of centuries time. There are two twins in the Torah called Esav and Yaakov. And Esav and Yaakov, Esav became a terrible, terrible person. And Yaakov, we know, became a tzaddik. And, and all the Jewish people, B'nai Yisrael, is Yaakov's other name, Yisrael. We all come from him. Rav Hirsch writes that the problem is, and we're allowed to say this, Rav Hirsch says it, and Judaism is never afraid to criticize its, its, its leaders. <laughs> Yaakov made a mistake, Rav Hirsch says. Rav Hirsch says that Yaakov raised them both the same. Yaakov should have realized that Esav was completely different to Yaakov. And therefore, Yaakov, oh, sorry, Yitzhak ra raised them both the same. Yitzhak should have realized that Esav and Yaakov were completely different and they needed a completely different education. But instead, he raised them in the exact same way. And what ended up happening is Esav went completely off. And Esav had no interest anymore in Torah and mitzvahs because he didn't, he treated Yitzhak the father, just treated him like Yaakov. He treated him the exact same way. And it's the worst thing he could have done. He made a mistake. And it's okay to say that. Now, there's a famous medrash, and that's a commentary on the Torah. And the medrash says that when Rivka was pregnant, she had twins in her tummy. And the medrash says that when she used to walk past shawls, yeshivas, Yaakov would start trying to get out. And when she would and bump around in the womb. And it says that when she walked past Avodah Zorah, idol worship places, Esau would bump around trying to get out the womb. So therefore, we see from an early age, even in the womb, that he, they, he, Esau had little chance. What chance would he have had? What could Yitzhak possibly have done to stop him worshipping idols and not being interested in mitzvahs? He wasn't interested in them in the womb before he even had proper consciousness. I once heard Rob Leff said the following, no. Nowhere in the Medrash does it say that he wanted to go and serve the idols. It says he wanted to get out. 
Maybe he wanted to get out and go and destroy them. Maybe he wanted to get out and go and grab those people who are worshipping those idols and say, what are you doing? Come and serve Hashem. Whereas Yaakov, it doesn't say he wanted to learn Torah in the yeshiva when he was bumping around. He had an attraction, a magnetic attraction to yeshivas, a magnetic, magnetic attraction to um, shuls. But again, not necessarily to learn Torah. That's where choice comes into it. He had a magnetic attraction, maybe to use Torah for the good, or maybe to use Torah to show off, look how much I know. That's the, we all have individual challenges. And when it comes to children with Esav and Yaakov, the idea was, is that Esav, he needed to hunt. He needed, maybe he should have been a shoichet. He should have killed animals to eat. Maybe he should have been a professional hunter. Maybe he should have been a sportsman. Esav needed action. Esav needed parents who would let him run around and hunt and be a from person who's involved in all the doing. And he's going and he's helping here and he's got this gemach and he's doing that and he's busy here and busy there. And Yaakov needed the parents who would say to him, you just sit and you learn. You go to the best yeshiva. You be the best person you can be. And Yitzhak made a mistake, and it's okay to say that. And the idea we have to take from this Rav Hirsch is to realize that our children are different, and it's okay to raise them in a completely different way. And I remember, and if you think they won't thank you, I want to tell you that they might, they, that they might not thank you now, but they will thank you later. And I'm not saying anywhere that you can't be disciplined to your children. Of course you can give them discipline, but it has to always be so overly embraced in love as well that the discipline is love. And I'll explain what I mean. I had someone who came to watch my lesson about a month ago, a young boy who was thinking about being a Rebbe. For some reason he came to watch me, maybe to put him off. But anyway, so he came to watch me. And after the lesson, I was like very impressed. I thought the lesson went really well. Like I planned it and it was there. Everything was great. And I went up to him and I go, I'll call him. I, well, I don't think he would mind. So anyway, the, he was called Motti. So I go up to him and I go, Motti, I go, what do you think of the lesson? And I was expecting him to go, yeah, you explained everything so well. He goes, it was brilliant. It was really good. I really enjoyed it. I go, really? I go, great. I go, well, can I have some feedback? What, what did you enjoy? He goes, I really enjoyed how you were strict with the kids. But then as soon as you would tell one off, within five or 10 minutes, you'd talk to him and praise him again. And I said to him, I had no idea I'd do that. I really didn't realize. He said, no, no, you do do it. And I'd realize it's something that's not natural. It's something that when you read, I actually think I've got it from secular books, actually, but it definitely the Torah, the Torah would agree 20 fold. There's something called sandwiching discipline, which means you say a positive, a negative, and then a positive, or 80 20 rule, whatever the rule is, that however many negatives you say you counter them during the day with this many positives so if you tell off your child because he made a mess how could you make a mess i've just cleaned up right it's over you've told him off now it's over now next time you see him and he's sitting nicely even if it's not a big deal thank you so look how nicely look how nicely moishi's sitting what a lovely boy did you mummy did you see how nicely moishi's sitting and the other kids are like, he's just sitting on a chair. It doesn't matter. Moishi hears the fact that he's being praised. When you, when you tell off a kid, it's like banging a nail into a wood. And the way to get that nail out is one praise at a time. And always 80-20. If you give a negative, try and give 80% positive and then 20% negative at the bare minimum. And if they don't thank you now, your children, for being strict, they don't thank you now for raising them in the proper way, they will later. And I'll tell you a story. There was once um, two men and they were in hospital. And these two men, we'll call them Moishi and, um, no, we, call them, we had enough Moishis tonight. We'll call them John and Steve. We'll do some English names. So John and Steve are in this hospital and they're both very elderly and they're both very sick. So John is by the window and Steve is on the other side of the room. So Steve's very jealous of John being by the window because they're, they're invalids and they lie there all day and John's got a window. So all day, Steve says to John, John, what can you see? And John goes, oh, it's amazing. It's a beautiful sky and there's a rainbow and the birds are singing. And oh, I can see a whole family playing in the park. Oh, and there's a football match and the best goal just happened. This person just headed it in the net. All day, he tells him these stories about what he could see out the hospital window. Anyway, a month passes and John dies. And Steve, they see him moving the body out. And Steve goes, nurse, nurse. He goes, yes, Steve. He goes, can I have the window now? And they go, sure, you can have the window. Are you sure you want the window? Yeah, I definitely want the window. So they move Steve over to the window. Open the curtain. 
Open the, we never open the curtain. John never wants, open the curtain. She opens the curtain and it's just a brick wall. Just a brick wall. And he realized that the whole time they'd been there for the whole month, John was telling him all these incredible stories and lifting Steve's spirits so much. And now he realized that it was just a brick wall. And the whole time he'd helped him so much with these incredible stories, uplifting him, making his stay in hospital so much better. Sometimes you only appreciate people when, they're, when, they, when you get older or when they're no longer around them. And you know that with children, they will appreciate you later. There's nothing wrong with being strict. There's nothing wrong with discipline if it's done in the proper way. And they will thank you for it later. Children don't mind discipline as long as it's done in the proper way. The last thing I'm going to just discuss very, very quickly is it says in Mishle, finally, it says, Neh Hashem Nishmas Adam, Choyfes Kol Chadrei Vatem. It says the soul of a person, the soul of a Jewish person, the soul, it doesn't say Jewish actually, says the soul of a person is like a candle of God. It's like a candle of God. We should realize that a Jewish soul, the Tanya says, it says a, a Jewish child's soul is like completely and utterly connected to Hashem. A candle, if we think about a candle, what a candle is, it's an incredible physical thing, a candle. Because if you put a candle next to another candle, they automatically go together and they automatically want to go up to the highest source. And that's exactly why Jewish people are compared to candles, because we're always trying to elevate ourselves. We're always trying to go and to approach Hashem in the proper way. And the idea is, is that the mother lights the Shabbos candles. It's not a coincidence. The reason that there's obviously lots of reasons, but a kind of a metaphysical reason that a mother lights the Shabbos candles is because the mother brings light into the home. The mother, through her midas, through the way she behaves, through her Torah, through her love for Torah, her love for mitzvahs, her positive energy, all the hard work she does, she brings in the light of mitzvahs into that house. She brings that longing of a flame of all of our neshamas that are all trying to reach up to Hashem. And the idea is, is that our children, their flames are small. And when you put them near to our flame, which is big, they latch on. And we're all trying to take us all up that our neshamas always and our lives should always be connected towards Hashem. And we need to realize that every Jewish child is like a light of Hashem. Every single Jewish neshama brings so much purity and so much love into the world. And we have to be a light onto those people around us. I remember I was once in Kollel and someone said to me, a friend of mine, he said, you know, he was, a, he became from, and his wife also became from, and they had an Israel, Israeli auntie who came to visit. So the Israeli auntie was sitting at the table and he has eight, I think he had eight children there. Now he's probably got about 67, but then he had eight. And they were sitting at the table and not, no one in the family was from at all, completely um, not from, not affiliated at all. And he'd become very religious with his wife and they had eight children. And the Israeli auntie sits at the table and she says, I can't say his real name. This one I can't do. We'll call him um, Yitzi. So he said, she says, Yitzi, tell me, why you have so many children? Why you have so many, eight children? Who has eight children? You have so many children. Why do you have so many children? Who has eight children? Privately, she said it, right? So he says to her, which one shouldn't I have had? And suddenly she was silent and she smiled. As in, when we look at numbers, a number is a number. But when you look at the individual child, we realize that each one is so special. Each one is so individually precious. And each one is like a light into the world of its Torah mitzvahs. And we have to be the people who are trying to elevate them and help that light to spread as much as possible. And the light of the mother, just like a light, one candle can give so much light to a room. So too the mother's light of mitzvahs and Torah can also make a massive difference in the house, a massive, massive difference in the life of their kids. I'll just finish with one final story. Rav Moshe Feinstein, he lived in America, in, I think he died in the 1980s. And Rav Moshe Feinstein was one of the biggest rabbis in America during a very difficult time. The Jewish people then weren't protected in law. They weren't protected with civil liberties. If you didn't work on Shabbos, you basically lost your job. That's how life was. And many Jewish people fell to that hurdle. And I'm not criticizing anyone because had I been there, I don't know what I would have done. But nevertheless, from a historical standpoint, many people couldn't pass the challenge. Work Monday to Friday, you don't come in on Saturday, you've got no job on a Sunday. And you get a slip saying you've been fired for not showing up to work. Moshe Feinstein had a neighbor. And this neighbor would lose his job 
I think he worked on the docks and he would lose his job every week for years, for years until he worked for a Jewish company. Every week, his family would struggle for food. Every week, his wife would struggle to get new clothes. Every week, he'd come home and he'd lose his job. And after years and years, Moshe Feinstein, the great Rob, he noticed that this person, all of his children were so unbelievably devoted to Judaism. And he just couldn't understand why. The father lost his job every week because of Shabbos. Why are you still all so devoted and positive about Judaism? So Moshe Feinstein once went to visit this great, this man. He wasn't just a normal Jew, Jewish fellow. And he went to visit on Sukkot. Because he was his neighbor. He wanted to go and see his sukkah. They were already elderly and the kids were around. He opens the sukkah of Moshe Feinstein, he looks inside and he sees his decorations. But the main decoration is a massive piece of string going from one side of the sukkah all the way to the other side. And hanging on this string is all little decorations, like little pieces of paper. So Moshe Feinstein goes over and he looks at them. What's this decoration? He says, I don't recognize this. It's not Hebrew writing, it's English writing. It says, you failed to show up for work on Saturday, you are fired. Next one, you failed to show up for work. And he had 52 from the whole year decorations of him losing his job because he kept Shabbos. And he put them the whole way from one side of the sukkah all the way to the other. And him and his children on sukkah's night would dance around them. And they would sing about how much they love Shabbos and how much they love Yontif and how much they love being, how much they love being Jewish. Moshe Feinstein said this changed him forever. And he completely understood what being a Jew is about. Being a Jew is in the good times. It's in the bad times. Raising our children is whatever happens. We try to give them the most positive, the most inspirational time in our home as we can possibly manage. So I'm going to leave space now a couple of minutes just so there are any questions i'm more than happy to take some i know on zoom normally there aren't but that's um i hope people can take some inspirational messages from there and can can help them in the future towards being their children in, in the proper way